morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's going to get better. <laughs> You know, Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6 says that he who has begun a good work in us will complete it. It doesn't say that he won't hit the pause button every once in a while. And every so often, God pauses us. I got to be honest, I don't like the pauses. Last week, we were paused. And uh, I found out that I don't like watching these services on TV. I would rather be here. And I am so glad to be here this morning. And so it's good to know that God has something to complete, and he will complete it, whether it runs smoothly or not. It's also good to know that God loves us even through the difficult times. So we're going to have a good service this morning, and people will, I believe, keep coming in, and we're going to go. We're going to do it. So I want you to bow your head with me, and let's pray and ask God's blessing. Our Father. Thank you for the morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you together. And God, we pray, bless our worship today. And we ask it in Jesus' name and as very best we can with as much as we have in us. We ask it for your glory. Amen. Well, good morning. Let's all dance. Uh, dance. <laughs> Let's all stand as we sing Soul on Fire. Two. You know, through everything that's going on, God's love never fails. He's always there for us.
about his love is always here for us. He always remains. You know, the greatest love that God has when he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. That was There's a about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ how he was crucified on the cross but you know he's alive and well today because after he was put in that tomb for three days he is alive and is with us today 
the head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior now to wash our feet. Now at his feet we bow. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you, Lord, thanking you for your blessings, Lord, thanking you for the privilege of being here to worship you today, Lord. Lord, we pray that you watch over everyone here, Lord. We pray that you watch over everyone that is sick and at home, Lord. We, uh, we again, we, we thank you for your blessings. In Christ's name, amen. All right, we're in 1 Peter chapter 1, spending a lot of time in this guy's books lately, it seems like. Am I on? 
is is this on because it's green um just asking I appreciate you being here this morning. Uh, you know, the news is finally getting us. Uh, by the way, Children's Church is staying here. Uh, I, they have been relentless. If, if somebody who's in a block of a church and catches and, and comes down with COVID, then they're blaming it on the church. And I'm hearing more and more and more. It's okay to go to work. And it's okay to go to school. And it's okay to go to the store. It's okay to go, to go, to go. But don't go to church. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. You'll get COVID there. And, uh, and, and I, I find myself wanting to say, think. Think a little bit. And, and just this week, and, and you're in here, you know who I was talking to. Somebody was talking to me, and they said their hairdresser was working them over about going to church and how dangerous it was. And I'm listening, and I said, says the person who's got their office open has run their hands through your hair and talking in your ear. And, and we just laughed. So... Good night. You know, the world's never happy about serving God. Good for you for being here this morning. If you're watching, good for you. We'll be here the next week. Be here. Okay? You can survive this. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 13. Just, just to, to get us started on this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cruise through this, so we, I, I won't keep you long. The aged apostle, this is getting toward the end of his life. He is writing, and, and, and I'm repeating here a little bit, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But he's writing to Jewish believers who have been scattered out of Jerusalem, Judea, and, and Israel. And they're out in Gentile territory, and they're discouraged. They're not fitting in anywhere. They're struggling to live. And so the apostle writes this what we call circular letter. It's a letter that was written to be shared, copied and shared and read. And he's, he is trying to do two things for them. He's giving them encouragement and instruction. And you know, there are times when we desperately need encouragement and instruction, don't we? I mean, you just don't know which way to go, and, and, and life just beats us up. So, that's what the apostle's doing. Now here, he starts, he gives the introduction, first couple of verses. In verses 3 down through 12, he gives uh, just a bunch of truth. In fact, our verse will start with therefore. It's not just something that was thrown out in the middle of nowhere. It's because of everything he says in verses 3 to 12. And so he says fact, 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 fact. He works down through verse 12 and then he starts into consequently, I got some instruction for you. Now, he goes a lot more than verse 13 with the instruction. But we're just going to stay in 13 today and you should be very grateful. It's going to shorten things down some. So let's look at this this morning because I think it's something we all need. I know I, I, this was just good for me. Let's look at the therefore. Let's look at what came before the therefore. Now I don't have to tell you therefore connects the statement with what went before. If I, if I tell Donna, if I just walked in one day and said, therefore you ought to respect me more. If something didn't go before that, she would be going, what? But if I walked in and I said, you know what, I work hard. And, and, and then gave, you know, gave, I'm trying to think of some things I could say that wouldn't just be ridiculous. But, uh, you know, I, I bring home a paycheck and I keep this house up and, and I keep your car full of, of gasoline. And, and, and on rare occasions I have it washed. And, and consequently, therefore... You know, there's always something that comes before. We understand that. It's a consequently instruction. So he's not just throwing this out of context. Uh, he's built a case for what we're going to need to do. And the therefore connects us with it. So what went before? Let me just scoot through these. And I'm not even going to, I'm not going to enlarge on them. Let's just scoot through them. I'm not even going to read them. Verse 3 says, because. It's like he said, because, or therefore, because you've been birthed to a living hope through Christ's resurrection. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Because you got a confidence. Verse 4, because you have a great inheritance. We've got one waiting for us on the other side. Man, it's, we've got some good stuff coming. Verse 5, because we are kept by God's power and not our own. Hallelujah for that. 
Verse 6, because we're still experiencing trouble, when verse 7 says, because God has given us the wherewithal to come through that trouble in victory. We don't have to stay there. Verse, uh, verse 8 says, because we have great grounds for joyful lives. Christians ought not to be living hangdog, uh, long-eared, suck-egg dog lives. We have a lot to be joyful about. Verse 9 says, because our faith is taking us somewhere good. Verse 10, because God has control of this thing and has had from the beginning. Pastor, it seems like everything's out of control. Nothing's out of control. Verse 11, because Christ paid for our sins and so we don't have to. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. That's a debt you couldn't pay and I couldn't pay. Verse 12, because the Holy Spirit is and has been active in us. Because of these wonderful things, here's some things we need to do. And there are three of them. And they're going to go quick. Here's the first one. He said, be ready. Notice, did I read this verse? Let's do that. Verse 13 says, therefore, therefore, Gird up the loins of your minds. You're, everyone here is thinking, man, I say that so often. I didn't know that was from the Bible. Gird up the loins of your minds. Be sober. Probably doesn't mean what you think it does. And rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's second coming talk. I don't know if you got the three of them. Let me give them to you. First one is this. Be ready. Now, the girding up the loins of your mind is an idiom. Uh, you know what an idiom is. If, if, if I'm talking to Jeff after church and he says, man, I put in 100 hours this last week. And I said, boy, you kept your nose to the grindstone. Well, that's an idiom. Uh, I, I really became more aware of idioms when my middle boy married uh, Angelese, who's Puerto Rican, and, had, and she'd just been speaking English about five years, and she did good with everything but idioms. And if I said, you are keeping your nose to the grindstone, I'd get, what that, in an email. She'd th what? Uh, I, I told her one time, this was one of my favorites, because we had a lot of fun with the idioms. She took a job when they first went to Jacksonville, she was trying to get a counseling job. She's, she's a licensed counselor, but in the meantime, she took a job in the daycare on the base. And so we're, one day we're going back and forth, and it turns out she was working midnights because that base runs all the time. And she said, yes, I work from, I think, 11 till 7 or whatever. And I said, oh, you're working graveyards. And I get this email back that says, yes, I'm putting diapers on little corpses all night. <laughs> and... Uh, she didn't know, she, well, I know what a graveyard shift is, don't you? It's an idiom. So when, when the apostle said, gird up the loins of your mind, nobody was going, what? But we do. And consequently, probably, unless you're reading a very literal, what we call formal equivalency translation, they, they interpreted that for you, and, it's, and your Bible says something to the effect of, uh, have your minds ready for action, or something along that line. What, that, what it was referring to is, is the wardrobe of the day. Everybody wore long, loose-fitting robes, male and female. They wore long, flowing robes. When you girded up your loins, what you did is you, you I don't know if you, I don't have a robe, but you reached down and you took front and back of that robe and you pulled it up here, and you took your belt and tied it across, and it left you with something similar to trousers. You had, they were like culottes. And so there were certain things, if you did it with that robe going, it was very hard to do, but if you girded up the loins of your robe, you could move. And so that became synonymous with get ready for action. When you girded up the loins, that meant you were ready to do something. You're going to wash the mule, or you were going to sweep the, uh, the floor, or something that required you to be able to move without dragging that robe through everything. So when he said, gird up the loins of your mind, that was a common phrase. You have probably never, it, those, you know, you probably never sat in a class and the teacher walked in and said, all right, everybody, gird up the loins of your mind, because... 
you would all say, yeah, but, but they knew. And so when the apostle said that, he was saying, and like I say, a lot of Bibles just kind of bypass that because it's an idiom and they know you're not going to get it. And they, they basically tell you to, to get ready for action. Get yourself mentally ready to go. Um, Peter said, get yourself mentally ready. Be ready to move. Lack of use causes atrophy. If you put your arm in a sling and didn't use it for 10 days, you wouldn't hardly be able to lift it. 10 days. You have got to be ready to go. And we may, listen, we may have weak faith for no other reason is it doesn't get any exercise. We're never ready for action. Our faith is, it's almost like a curio. It's something that we dust every once in a while and we leave it up to look at and we treasure it and we prize it on our mantle at home. We've got this mantle and we have some, uh, we have a vase that we bought. Uh, I'm thinking of it right now. It's a potter's vase and we bought it at a pottery shop in Jerome, Arizona, which is a uh, kind of a touristy place, used to be a mine, and now it's a touristy place, and went into this pottery shop, and for like 30 bucks, we got this vase, and we don't put anything in it. There are no flowers in it. We don't, we don't store any oil in it. It's not a widow's cruise. All it is is you can turn on the back, and you can see where we bought it, and it's a curio, and we kind of treasure it because it's a memory, and we remember where we got it, and it's a keepsake, but we don't use it. We don't exercise it. I don't even know if it'll hold water. And our faith is like that sometimes. You know, well, yeah, I believe this, so what does that do for you? Well, I don't know. I dust it every once in a while, but I really don't use it. There's no practical significance to it. Let me ask you a question, and don't answer it out loud. What in your life do you do by faith? What do you do that you need God to come through or it'll fail? What do you do that you step out and say, there is a God out there, and I'm doing this because he says, and, and Father, you better show up, because I'm going to launch in you. Peter says, be ready to step out. Gird up the loins of your mind. So I know you're outside of Israel. I know you don't have any friends. I know the money's not where it used to be. I know you lost your business and you lost your family. And I know synagogues don't want you around. And I know when you go to the, 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 what assembly there is, it's mostly Gentiles. And you're having a hard time identifying with those people. And you don't like them. And they don't like you. And you're trying to learn to love them. And life's hard. Well, get ready to exercise your faith. You need to exercise your faith. Good advice. Here's the second one. Be sober. That has nothing to do with alcohol. He's talking there about being serious. Be serious about what you're doing. Being sober-minded says be serious about your faith. So many American believers are just casual about our faith. It's like we're culturally Christian. We grew up with it. But it's just one of many things. And so we hit that level of comfort. And, and we know how to handle it. We know how to handle what we do and what we believe and how we worship. Whether God shows up or not, we can handle it. I mean, we're pretty organized. We've got, we got the language down. we got the songs down. we got the culture down. We're all right. We can make it. Lord, I hope you show up. But if you don't, I got this. Now, we would never say that, but that's kind of the way we live, and we just drift along, never giving our spiritual lives a serious thought. It's just there. It's just kind of there. Donna has one of those weighted blankets. You guys know what a weighted blanket is? They are a huge inconvenience is what they are. We bought this thing, and it must weigh 50 pounds, and it's what it's supposed to do is, is help you with restless leg syndrome. And, I, and they work. They, they do work. And we got to looking at one, and it was on wood or something. And it was a pretty good price. And, and I said, let's get this thing. So we get it. The problem is it's not real big, but it's big enough that it goes over into my side of the bed. That's my territory. And I'm territorial about my side of the bed, just so you'll know. Little inside in pastor. 
And so when I lay down, there's this blanket that's like this thick, and I lay down, and half of me's on that blanket and half it. And I'm not getting under it because I, it's like I can't breathe. It is heavy. And it really does a lot of good for Donna. But what it is, it's something that when I fought it for a while, and so when I'd make the bed up, I'd pull it away over to where just her side of the bed had it, and it'd hang over here. But somehow it would mysteriously get back over on my side of the bed. And I finally decided I just got to learn to live with this. I'm going to learn to live with it. And I do. So I get in bed at night, and I, am, I'm, I sleep kind of like that on that blanket. But you know what? The longer I live with it, the more used to it I am, and I really don't think much of it anymore. Uh, in fact, I hadn't thought much of it until just now. I'm kind of ticked about it now, but really, had thought, <laughs> really hadn't thought much of it. I've just gotten used to it. It's there. I know it serves a good purpose because Donna needs it. But it's just a part of my life. I'm not real serious-minded about that blanket. I was at first. I was determined that there was this line of demarcation and woe be under that blanket if it crossed it, but it's just there. You know, our spirituality is kind of that way sometimes. It's just there, and we know it's there, and we're used to it, and it gives us a little bump here and there, but the truth of the matter is we're not real serious about it, and people see that. And if we stop to think about it, we see it. And Peter said, don't do that. Be sober-minded. Don't let life get in the way of your faith. Here's, here's the point. Our faith is as much a part of our mind as it is our heart. It's not just something you believed and asked God to do at one point, but it's something that should affect the way our minds work. And our minds should be saturated. That's why God said... Don't be conformed to this world. Don't let the world push you into its shape, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you'd know what is that good and complete, that perfect will of God. He said, be serious about this. So the apostle said, because of all these good things, we need to be mentally ready to go, and we need to be serious about what we believe. And then he said at the end there, be hope-filled. Exercise biblical confidence. Ho your hope that would be fully on the grace that is to be brought. You know, your hope is not hanging on. Your hope is not hoping you'll finish well. Our hope is fully on the grace that will be revealed one day. Here he goes. And, and the apostle talks a little later about this. The scoffers that say, so where is the promise of his coming? Well, he said, you need to rest your hope fully on the grace that's going to be revealed one day when he comes back. Hope in this kind of hope in Scripture is always future fixed. You don't hope for something you already got, right? So if somebody says, how are you doing? Well, I hope I'm doing well. Well, you either are or you aren't. You're talking future. I hope I don't find out I'm not. It's always future fixed. Peter is saying that things are going to get better. A lot better. You know, I mentioned this morning it'll get better. And I was really talking about this morning. Don't know if it really has so much. But the fact is we're in a wave right now. There's a wave of the COVID going over. And we all knew that eventually you're probably going to get it. And you may be thinking, well, I won't. Well, I hope you don't. But a lot of us will. And in, 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 in all, almost certainly you're going to come through it okay. That's something like 99 point what percent do okay. And you'll come through it. You'll get through it. It's happening. Now, if you listen to the TV, and, and I don't mean to be hard on the media. Well, I do. But, uh, you know, the truth of the matter is they're telling us what they want us to hear. So we'll behave the way they want us to behave. So consequently, they have a spaz attack every time anybody gets this thing. And you don't hear the report that you will almost certainly survive this in most cases are mild because they're afraid you won't behave the way you should. So all you get is, <gasps> you know, if they reported traffic accidents the way they do COVID, none of us would drive. But the fact is, you are going to get in an auto accident. If you haven't yet, you will, and you'll almost certainly survive it. So you take your chances and you take precautions. You put on your seatbelt, you stop at stop signs, and you know that there may be some guy rear-end you. 
but you got to get around. I'm, I'm off my outline, so let me backtrack. What I'm making a point here, too, and it's probably a pretty good one. Um, it's going to get better. A lot better. Let me get back to what I was wanting to say. I know that sometimes we kind of wink that truth away. Well, yeah, Jesus is coming back, you know, theoretically. But one day, all of these struggles are going to be memories. One day, your frustrations are going to be memories. Truthfully, they'll either be bad memories, I don't know which, we're going to have a a spiritual perspective, or they may be one of those things you think back on and you just kind of smile. Can you believe the way we panicked? Can you believe how discouraged I got? Can you believe the hopelessness I felt? I had, I really wasn't taking this seriously. But one of these days, Listen, rest your bold biblical confidence fully on the grace that will one day be revealed when Jesus Christ comes back and he sets it all straight. Well, what about those people that hurt me? He sets it all straight. Well, what about all the injustice going on? He sets it all straight. What about the fact that I've suffered more than the guy down the street? He'll set it all straight. It'll all be set perfectly straight. What about the, the weak frustration I have with myself? What about the fact that I, I, I cannot understand why God doesn't zap me and take me out of this thing? I don't understand how God could love me. One day, he'll set it all straight. And the apostle said, listen, get yourself ready to go. Be serious about this thing. And know this, know this, know this. Be boldly confident that it's going to be okay. It really is. You know, God has done so much for us. I could spend three weeks on the first 12 verses here of the things that God has done for us. And God is with us constantly, even when the times aren't good. He's with us. And he's involved. Preacher, you don't know what I'm going through. I, I don't. But he does. And he'll never leave you. Or forsake you. He'll never leave you alone or let you down. And we have so much life to live and to live for. And the apostle really here, if you summed it up, is saying, live this thing. I know you're not where you wish you could be. I know the climate's different. I know the economy's different. I know the people are different. I know the language is not what it used to be. I know, there's, I know all the things you were used to and took comfort in have been ripped away from you. You know what? You've got your faith. Live it. Be serious with it. Know that it'll get better. Know that I'll take care of it. Know that I'm with you. Ready yourself. Be serious about your faith. And remember the good promises of God. Because God's never gone back on a promise. That's a good verse. Especially when we put it in con context. I want you to stand. And... Uh, and we're going we're gonna to close with a, with a word of prayer this morning. <clears throat> so bow your heads with me, if you would. Our Father, now, our crowd's thin this morning, and if, if that's what everything depended on, we'd be in a bad spot. Lord, some of us have so many challenges, physical, economic, jobs, and if everything depended on that, we'd be in a bad spot. But we have a living faith in a living God who loves us. And Lord, you pour grace out on us. Favor we don't deserve. 
Lord, the older I get, the more I realize how little I deserve it. So, Father, help us, I pray, to gird up the loins of our minds, to ready ourselves for spiritual action, and that we would become sober-minded, that we would be serious about this thing we call our faith, this body of truth that you've given us, some of which was listed in this verse. And then, Father, we pray that we'd fix our focus on you and not only what you have done and what you do, but what you're going to do. Because you are so good to us and it's just going to get better. Make us more into the image of you, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Now, we're, I, I think we're going to have announcements, right, David? Yeah, you can sit down. Let me say something real quickly. I don't have a date for you yet, but it's coming in February. Uh, guys, we used to have a men's breakfast back in, back in, back in the day. And uh, truth be told, it was a little lackluster, mostly because the guy in charge of it just wasn't good at planning things like that. So I, I want to give a go at something here, and, and I'll give you a date here in the next week or so, but... What I, what I, I want to do is, is about one, maybe every other month, us, all the guys that want to meet at a restaurant at like 8 in the morning on a Saturday morning and just have breakfast together. Uh, nobody's going to stand up and lecture you through the breakfast, but it'll give us a chance to fellowship a little bit and enjoy a meal together and get away from the women folk. You know, we can whittle and spit and things like that. And... Uh, Guys, just have a, a time together, and I, I hope you'll be interested in that, but I, I think it'd be enjoyable meet at Dumplings or somewhere that's big, and, and uh, we can get a place to set together and, uh, and just enjoy some, some time together and, and do a little bit of uh, properly socializing. And so I'm just giving you a heads up so that you kind of get that in your head. I know eight's not as early as I eat, and it's earlier than some of you eat, but I think it's a fair time. So if you have other things to do, it'll cut you free to do them. So that's coming. And it's not going to be up here because I really hadn't said much about it to Brother David. But he has other things he's going to share. And so hear these. And, uh, and then you'll be, you'll be done with the morning. And we are in good time. Good morning. Welcome to Tanglewood Baptist Church. I'm Morgan, and if you would please hang out with us for a couple more minutes, we have some important announcements we need you to know. If you're a visitor here with us today, we're so glad that you came. We'd love to have record of your attendance. Please take a visitor card from the pew in front of you and fill it out. Get it to the Connection Center in the back, and we have a small gift waiting for you. Awana resumes tonight, January 31st. We hope to see all of our workers at 510 for our prayer meeting and all of our kids at 530. See you tonight. Our chili fundraiser has been postponed. We'll let you know when we have a new date set up. Our online giving function is back up from our website. Just click on the Give tab. You can also continue to give electronically at the Connection Center in the back or drop an envelope in the boxes in the auditorium. We want to invite you to celebrate with us. We have a very special baptism service next week immediately following morning services. That's February 7th next week. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and have a great rest of the week. Bye. All right, before you go, there's been one change. No Awana tonight because we are just absolutely poor on workers. It's not the kids as much as I think all of our group leaders are, are going to be out but one. So uh, one more night off of Awana. And, uh, I mean, you can come if you want to, but the doors will be locked. All right? You're dismissed.